Hi. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I know there's a lot of cannabis uh, happening. Cannabisness, I believe, is what it's called now, right? Uh, both in the sessions and on the street uh, here in uh, Austin. So I appreciate you guys taking a break from that to spend time with us here. As my 75-year-old mom said last week when we were in Colorado skiing together and she walked out of a restaurant late at night, I smell a skunk. <laughs> Pretty much everywhere in Austin smells a little skunky lately. Um, so anyway, thank you for coming. There's tons of options. Obviously, there's a ton of programming. It's fantastic at South By that you guys could all be going to. And the fact that you came here is hugely appreciated. So really, thank you guys. Um, so I've given a lot of these talks. Some of you have been to some of those talks before. And I know three things for sure. People love stories. People love oddly inappropriate stories about poop or crotches. And three, people love free shit and beer, and especially free beer. And so that's why we handed out a bunch of beer. I'm sorry we couldn't buy 1,000 cans of beer, but I think we bought 240. So, um, And we had Operation Hilton Breach. Uh, it was like a fucking like a, like Ocean's Eleven movie with us rolling these suitcases full of beer in here. So. Um, <laughs> It was pretty cool. Um, we had contingency planning and everything. So anyway, so in that vein, I want to start this with a story. The story doesn't have any poop, doesn't have any crotches in it, but it's an interesting story that might give you a context of how I like to lead. So uh, I don't know. Many years ago, when I first started our company, I we didn't have a lot of money. We weren't a super successful company, but I was super proud of this health and wellness program that we established back then. And what it was was basically we'd give $50, $100 a month to any employee that did healthy shit. So some people would use it to reimburse themselves for health club membership or for yoga classes or whatever the case might be. Some guy, I remember one guy bought running shoes every few months. So anyway, that was this thing I was super proud of. I was also super proud of being really generous when I could and I took the team out for lunch every day. I tried to take them out at, for dinner whenever I could. And one night we were out for dinner as a group and dinner, dinner turned into drinks, turned into more drinks, turned into more drinks. We were at this outdoor uh, beer garden, and I went to the bathroom, and I came back around the corner, and all of a sudden I was, I smell a skunk. <laughs> and I looked, and a couple of my team were smoking as my seven, no, nine-year-old son now, we'll call it, the marijuana. And I walked over to them. I don't know anything about that stuff. I tried to keep clear of, you know, I'm, I'm like a 2% milk guy. Um, but anyway, I walked over to him, I'm like, why the fuck are you guys smoking anything? It's so bad for your health. Like, there's vaporizers, there's edibles, there's all these different things, the way you could be doing this. And they're like, well, and this is a while ago, so like, vaporizers are really expensive, Michael. And I'm like, health and wellness, guys, submit the fucking receipts, we'll pay for it. <laughs> and they're like, we work for the greatest company in the world. So let's be clear, I never wanted to be in charge. I just wanted to be able to skateboard whenever I wanted. Like that was it, period. I just wanted to figure out a way to have flexibility so I could skateboard whenever I wanted. That's it. And still pay my rent. And we'll talk about this in more depth as we get deeper into this talk, but I have the unique distinction, and some of you know this, that I have zero training in what my career has been around, and I also have zero training in leadership. <laughs> so, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, in that vein, to further bolster that statement, here's a quick snapshot of my work history. Nope. Oh my god, I gave them the clicker because I can't be trusted with it. And they fucked up right now, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if it was me with the clicker, it'd be on the first slide when we were like 48 minutes in, so um, this is better. So anyway, some impressive shit up there, right? Uh, lots of pizza delivery, lots of lawn mowing, circuit board assembler and disassembler, that's heavy stuff. Um, pretty impressive CV. I bet you I could tell you a story about any one of those jobs that involves examples of good leadership or bad leadership. This is kind of a risk, but which one do you guys want me to talk about? <laughs> someone wants space station, someone wants nude model. <laughs> well, a lot of people want nude model, apparently. Um, I was hoping you'd pick diarrhea researcher, honestly. I had a really good dad joke for that one. I was like, that was a shitty job. And then we talked about it, and one of our employees was going to yell something. What were you going to yell? That joke stinks. 
Ah, see what we did there? Wordplay. Um, so anyway, nude model. I don't have a story probably of leadership around that, but I do have a story of crotches, so I could tell that. I'll try to be quick. So it's a funny story, but bear with me. So when I was in college, I was delivering pizzas freshman year, because that's basically what I'm trained to do, um, is deliver pizzas. And I was delivering pizzas for $4.25 an hour to the dorms. So $4.25 plus tips, $4.25 an hour. We were delivering to the fucking dorms, and no one tipped. And so I remember I saw a sign on like a posting in the cafeteria or whatever, they could make $22 an hour being a nude model in the art department. And I was like, I am doing that instead of this. And so I signed up right away, went over to the art department, got my you know, application in. Apparently I met whatever stringent qualifications they had, and I was hired the next day. I showed up for my first session, I'm like 18, I don't own a fucking robe, so I'm wearing basketball shorts and a t-shirt. And the professor's like, where's your robe? And I'm like, I wanna have a robe? And she's like, all right, we'll just get up there. And so I, like, I get up, like, can I, this is white, I'll stand on this. So I get up on the stage and I'm like, you know, in front of the whole class and I turn around and I know seven people. <laughs> I've made out with two girls in the class. There's one girl that I have the biggest crush on in the world. It's very cold in the room. <laughs> and I just pull my basketball shorts down and I'm like, all right, here we go. And so I did that for like two years and jumped forward like six months later that same first year. And uh, they had me pose, like, okay, here's a leadership story. One of the professors was awesome. She was super empathetic, really clear and concise in her direction. And, but except for the one time she had me fucking dress up in like climbing boots, like ice axes and a fucking spelunking helmet or something, naked. I don't know what weird fucking website that's on now, but, um, but anyway, she was super good at making it comfortable for something that was really uncomfortable. And so one day she like set me up in like this like Greek tragic pose where I'm like, like arched over the thing like this. And I hear all this commotion in front of me and she's like, we're gonna hold this pose for three hours. Just stay still and it's easy. Like I just gotta lay there, right? And so my head's arched back and three hours later she ends the session and she's like, all right, Michael, fantastic job. Really, really appreciate it. And I kind of like come up, Ugh. I go, mm. the girl that I have a huge crush on for three hours sat right here. She drew in every curl, every detail from here to here. So I was terrified, I'm like 18. I literally grabbed my shorts and the gun and ran out of there. Later that night I was at the grocery store and I have like arm full of stuff and I'm walking out the door of the grocery store and I like I'm looking down and I slam into someone, everything flies everywhere, I bang my head, it's her. She's now my wife. I'm totally fucking lying. She's not my wife. <laughs> if my wife was drawing people's crotches, do you think I'd be fucking married to her? I never saw that fucking weirdo again. So here's a little more background on me. I'm the founder and the creative director of a branding agency called Occupop. I've also helped start a number of other companies either, either as an investor or co-founder. This talk will be mostly informed by my work at Occupop, but some of those other companies will get in the mix as well. Thanks to our success and my willingness to sell ridiculous stories like that, I have been asked to do a lot of talks like these. Generally speaking, I try to share the stories that got me to where I am today. More than anything else, I try to share the mistakes that I've made. I hope you find some of this stuff engaging. I hope you can find some nuggets of goodness in here. At the very least, I hope you can give yourself a pat on the back for not being as big a dipshit as I am. So, uh, next slide is the, that's not, some of you saw this a couple years ago probably. That's not my elementary school gymnasium, but it's a pretty good replica of it. So third grade, gym class. Our teacher, who's a dead ringer for David Hasselhoff, only with a mustache. Her name was Mrs. Pazarakis. <laughs> we used to call her Spazarakis. She's like, today we're climbing the rope. She's got like a, you know, whatever, inch thick fucking rotting mat on the ground. She's like, climb to the top, touch the ceiling, come back down. We're fucking third graders. We've got the upper body strength of 
third graders, right? So like, it seems impossible to everyone but this dude who's like on steroids in third grade, I swear to God, Carter Schwartz, I remember. And so he goes first and he just like, <laughs> climbs up the thing like crazy, super fast, pumps his fist, comes back down. And we're all like, fuck, we're, what? And so a couple other kids go, they fail, and then it's my turn. So I may be a weak third grader, but I got two things going for me. One, my mom was always willing to keep me in super sweet sneakers. I foot the bill now, but thanks, mommy. Um, secondly, I, <laughs> I don't have awesome fashion now. I had way worse fashion in third grade. I wore brown corduroys every single day. And so between the wide whale on my inner thighs and the Vulcan death grip of my Adidas, I was able to get about 10 feet up the rope, and all of a sudden the thought dawned on me. What if I fall? And I look down at Mrs. Spazarakis, Spazarakis, and I'm like, what if I fall? And in my recollection, she's definitely smoking a cigarette in the gym. <laughs> and she looks up at me with like complete disgust and she looks at the rest of the class. She's like, do you want to fall? Do any of you assholes want to fall? Now, like the, the wife story earlier, she probably didn't say assholes, but it makes a better story. And it was New York in the 80s, so she might have said assholes. She probably said motherfuckers, I bet. Like, she was probably doing, doing cocaine at the time. But anyway, she said, like, do any of you want to fall from way up there to way down here? And I'm like, I thought about it for a second. And I'm like, no, I don't want to fall. And she's like, well, then you won't. So I climbed that fucking rope. And I got to the top. But here's the thing. I made it to the top of that rope. But the entire time, there's this voice in my head screaming over the pounding of my heart the buzz of adrenaline saying, you're gonna fall. You're gonna look like an idiot, everyone's gonna laugh at you. Your shitty brown corduroys are gonna split open and your shoes are gonna fly off your feet like a goddamn car accident victim and everyone's gonna be, make fun of you. That voice is my anxiety, that's my imposter complex. Some of you know I like to call him Benicio and he's been there my entire life and the dynamic has pretty much always been the same. Internal sort of doubt and anxiety, battling outward confidence and bravado. I'm great at getting myself halfway up that rope, but never quite sure I can make it to the top. And even when I do get to the top, I'm pretty sure everyone knows I have no fucking idea how I got there and that I don't know what I'm doing. <sighs> Since that diet day climbing that stupid rope, as far back as I can remember, I've dealt with mild to severe anxiety. Let's go to the slide, the next slide. Pretty fucking cute, right? Oh, well, that's not nice. Um, two collar minimum, always. Keep that on the radar there. Um, anyway, layering is what men's fashion is all about, I've been told. Um, so, you know, that voice in my head has always been really explicit. It's not just you're going to fail the test. It's not just you're going to make an error in the Little League game. It's you're going to fuck up and flunk out of school. You're going to make an error in the championship and lose the season for your team. That same anxiety has led to almost all the success in my life as well. Being legitimately terrified, 100% convinced that I'm gonna fuck it up, that constant doubt and critical voice has certainly come close to crippling me at points, but more often than not, it's on the losing side of the argument. Anxiety tells me I'm gonna fail and just almost, almost completely convinces me not, I'm gonna bomb, but not to the point of apathy. It's fucking awful, I feel like shit. I'm, I'm frazzled, I'm frantic, but I'm tenacious. I'm tenacious in fighting back that anxiety and making sure to counter every argument it raises and to consider every contingency and ultimately win. Because I don't suck, even though he tells me that all the time. And it's awesome to beat that motherfucker. So, let's get back to that really impressive career arc I shared earlier. So, ultimately, I kind of started this agency by accident. Uh, my brother and I were pretty good snowboarders back in the day and we really wanted to be pro snowboarders. So some of you have heard this origin story, so I'll get through it quickly. Our brilliant plan of how to become pro snowboarders was to move to Colorado and snowboard, period. Like this is before fucking influencers or social media, like there was no way to like, you just gotta get out there. And well, that was not a great plan, but it worked well enough anyway. I was good enough to make enough money from shitty odd jobs and snowboarding and selling all the surplus gear that I got for free to have a super fun life. A, basically a subsidized like professional child for a few years. And it was really fun, you know, traveling around with fat friends, never really feeling that crippling anxiety of school or real life. But that voice in my head was even louder than ever during those years. I felt like an imposter the entire time. I still do even talking about it now. 
I was not good enough to be a pro snowboarder. I was barely good enough to not be embarrassed to be with, you know, competing with the guys that were the real deal. But here's the thing, in 2000, I think, it, no, 98 maybe, I was in a team meeting for one of the companies I was riding for, and the CEO of the company was lamenting that they were gonna have their first website, and it was gonna cost them $5,000. And he was just like, that is insane. Why would we spend $5,000 on a website? And I raised my hand in the back of the room and said, fuck that, I will build it for $500. And he said, you know how to build websites? I was like, totally. And I went to the library and I checked out a book on how to build websites, and that's how Occupop started. I climbed way too far up that rope and then scrambled and scrapped and figured out how to get to the top. So I just happened to say yes to that, that website opportunity and it snowballed from there. But once it got rolling, I realized that I could actually make a job out of this shit. I decided I wanted to continue to build a company around the kind of work and flexibility that I wanted, and it kind of started to succeed in spite of the fact that I had no business running it. And because I had no training and we had no reason not to, we did things the way we wanted to. No one could tell us not to. We didn't make enough money, nor did we need enough money to care. As I started to add employees, there was no question that they would get the same flexibility and fun that I did. I would have felt horribly guilty if they didn't. So it was a matter of fact that we'd have no vacation policy, no PTO, no set schedules. Everyone could work wherever the fuck they wanted. I don't give a shit. As long as the work gets done, you can take as much time as you want off. I want us all to be having maximum fun and living the best version of a life, our life we can. We had a woman two years ago work from Bali for three months. Shit, John Burr, who's not here today, unfortunately, funniest man in the world, one of our developers, he works from a fucking pickup truck down by the beach in British Columbia for a month at a time in the summer so he can surf every day. There's a camper in the back of the pickup truck. He's not just like a homeless person, but I mean, that's, that's our culture. We pay 100% of everyone's benefits. We max out everyone's retirement. We take everyone on awesome annual retreats to super cool places all over the world. I'm an awesome boss. It's a fucking awesome company to work for. Except for, I'm full of shit. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm doing. And for like half of my career, I've been the worst fucking boss in the world. 12 or 13 of my employees are here. You can talk to them about it. They'll corroborate. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit more about the less glamorous side of that or origin story quick, the anxiety side of things. Anxiety isn't just how I'm wired, sure, a lot of it comes from genetics and chemical shit, but it's how I view myself, it's the opinions I've formed, appraisal, judgment. In objective context, context like uh, in objective context, uh, imposter anxiety is really fun to overcome, right? Like when you're a kid and you're in a class, like for me, you're in the honors class. You have no business being here. You're a dipshit. Everyone else here is a genius. Well, I studied like crazy, didn't sleep, lost all my friends, but I got an A and I obliterated those specific imposter feelings, right? But as you get older in life and jobs, there aren't a lot of tests to ace. There aren't a lot of races to win. And so when your anxiety, your imposter feelings are being fueled by an unobtainable goal, it's really hard to vanquish those specific feelings. So let me break it down for you quick. For a lot of people, success is measured in terms of money. Right? I've made what I consider a really great living for about 20 years, but I'm still working, so I haven't made fuck you levels of money yet. Um, but we're good. Like, our companies are stable, my family's taken care of, we're in a great spot. But for years, I've had colleagues, friends, clients who are exiting for millions and hundreds of millions of dollars all over the place. And so I've never been one person who was motivated by money. The difference between having to worry about it and not between working and being done became unintentionally the test I was trying to get an A on, the race I was trying to win. So when that anxiety is forever screaming in my ear, you're a piece of shit loser, you think you're successful, fuck you, you're not. What do you do? Well, if I felt like an imposter, I sure as shit wasn't gonna show it. I built up a facade of success, of having my shit together, of being a superhero, working 16 hours a day. I wanted to make sure that people, shit that, pe shit that people would expect to get done in a week, I would get done in a day. I would make sure that people saw that I was working at midnight and again at 4 a.m. I wanted everyone to know that I was killing it. And though I was never whole or confident or comfortable, it worked. Everyone around me was blown away. Clients were constantly raving about how fantastic our work was, how remarkably responsive we were, how spectacularly fast our team was, how prolific I was. But let's talk about that a little bit more later. I wanna talk about another company that's far more successful and bigger and more impressive than anything I'll ever be involved in. It's a company called Alcoa. Does anyone know what Alcoa is? The guy talking about space stations probably knows what Alcoa is over here. It's the aluminum company of America. They make the wrappers on Hershey Kisses. They make uh, the aluminum for the space station. They make Coke, uh, the, the Lone Star cans are probably from Alcoa. 
So anyway, it, this is a story from The Power of Habit. It's a great book. If you ever uh, check it out, you'll enjoy it. Um, so I'll probably get some of the details wrong, but I'll give you the gist of it. So they had a new CEO named Paul O'Neill, and he came in in the late 80s, like 87, 88, and they trotted him out in front of a huge room of top investors and analysts. And those analysts uh, and investors you know, are there to assess this new CEO and figure out what they're going to do with the investment. And the first thing out of his mouth was something along the lines of, I need to get back over here because I don't remember. <laughs> I intend to make Alcoa the safest company in America. I intend to go for zero injuries. Obviously, the investors and analysts were a little bit taken aback by this, right? They expect a new CEO to talk about profit margins, about marketing plans, about inventories, about business shit, right? And so they actually started interrupting him and asking him those sorts of questions. And he said, fuck you. No, he didn't say fuck you. He's far more professional than I am. He said, you know, uh, I'm not certain you're listening to me. If you want to see how Alcoa is doing, you need to look at safety figures. Those are more important than profits. So, if within a year of that meeting, Alcoa uh, reached their highest mark of profitability. By the time he retired from the company 13 years later, their market cap was $27 billion. If you had invested a million dollars in Alcoa in 1987, if you sold it when he left the company in 2000, you would have earned a million dollars in dividends in those 13 years, and you would have increased your uh, stake by 5x. So how did he turn this company into a profit machine and a paragon of safety? By focusing on this one habit and allowing changes to ripple out from there. So basically his theory was that he knew he wanted to transform the company, but you can't just be like, hey, all right, guys, transform, like change. He figured if he could find one thing to disrupt habits around, he could see the change ripple out from there. So the story that really crystallized this for me in my head from the book that I read was this incident that happened very early in his time at the company. He got a frantic phone call from the plant manager in the middle of the night, and it turned out that this young employee, this new hire, super ambitious, had jumped a safety guard, safety railing, and went into the pit because a machine was jammed up. And he went in, and he removed the piece of metal that was jamming up the machine. He fixed it, and he turned around to walk away, and this six-foot steel arm swung down and hit him in the head and killed him instantly. He was trying to make the money because his wife was pregnant, which is kind of sad. And so O'Neill collected all the executives from that plant as well as others, and they recreated the instant incident with diagrams. They looked at video. They tried to analyze what went wrong. And ultimately, O'Neill stopped the meeting and said, we murdered this man. We killed him. And all the executives were kind of like, whoa, hey, dude. Probably didn't say that either. Um, but anyway, they were like, you know, it's heavy manufacturing. Shit happens. It's tragic. It's awful. But like, and he's like, no. Safety is our number one priority. So within a week of that meeting, they repainted every safety railing at every Alcoa plant worldwide. They set new policies. They reminded every manager and every employee that they would not be penalized for slowing down production to make things safer. And O'Neill, the CEO, sent a note to every single employee in the company, giving them his home phone number at the time and telling them to call him if they had any ideas on how to improve safety or if any, any of their managers didn't respect the requests they made for improved safety. And so here's the thing. He started getting a shit ton of phone calls, but they weren't about safety. They were about improving the company in a million other ways. The best story I remember from it, and then I'll go on to some other stuff, was the uh, aluminum siding division. Apparently they tried to predict what color would be popular the next year, and they would always get it wrong. And so they were losing money. And so this low-level employee who had been suggesting this idea for years, but never to management, said, let's just move the fucking pigment machines from over here to over here and group them together. And then we can change colors instantly. They did that. Profits in that division doubled within months and it was super successful. There are dozens and dozens of stories around that. So by establishing an organizational habit of suggesting safety improvements, he created other habits. By shifting working safety habits, he had created patterns of better communication and a chain reaction happened. So, Keystone habit, remember that for later. All right, so next slide. That's just a cute picture of my kids in a bucket. <laughs> so I said I knew, what, three things about talking earlier? I guess, or four, about the free beer was four. I know five. Number five, people love cute pictures of kids doing dumb shit. Put it in your talk. But anyway, so, um, the most important job I will ever have as a leader is being their dad, no question. 
think I'm doing an okay job. Well, you'll tell me at the end of the talk. There's a couple stories. And so I thought about, could I tell some stories about being their baseball coach or their soccer coach or how I'm the funnest dad in the world, et cetera, et cetera. I ultimately settled on a really cool little story that's really about the best leader in our household, which is my wife, Sarah. So Sarah, from day one, always insisted that we treat the kids as openly and honestly as we could, to treat them with as much dignity and respect as their tiny dipshit minds can handle. And one core tenet of this policy was always referring to body parts. Oh, this has a crotch in it. All the body parts by their given biological name. So there was never wee-wees or hoo-hoos or any of that shit in our household. It's always been penis and vagina from day one. And so Izzy had this autoimmune disorder. So my daughter's Izzy, my son is Hawken. My wife's Swedish, so it's a Swedish name. So Izzy had this autoimmune disorder when she was young, about this age, like three, four years old. And it would manifest itself as these skin lesions. They weren't super bad, but they were uncomfortable. They hurt her, and we had to put cream on them. And so it, she grew out of it. It's not a problem anymore. One night, they were getting into the bathtub, an actual real bathtub, not a bucket. And uh, I remember she sat down in it, and the second her vagina hit the water, she started screaming. Oh my God, it hurts! Oh, 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 oh. And it turned out that this rash had attacked her crotch. So we put the cream on it, which as a dad was not the funnest thing in the world, but we did it and it went away. So jump forward like three, four months later. Hawken and Izzy are sitting in the bathtub. He's playing with boats and dolls. She's playing with who knows what. And all of a sudden, Hawken, who's two years old, turns to her. Oh, Izzy, how's your vagina doing? <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's all better now. Oh, great. Glad to hear it. I'm just back to playing with shit. And I'm like, oh my God, through treating them with dignity and respect and honesty and setting really high expectations for them, my wife and me and my best way of following her lead had like allowed these two kids to have this incredibly like dignified, respectful conversation about a really uncomfortable topic that like any two of us would be really uncomfortable about having after this talk. So I thought that was a fun story. So let's go to the next slide of the team. We, let's take a second and go back to those Occupop retreats I kind of skirtingly mentioned earlier. So we have an interesting structure to our company. We have a headquarters in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We have about a ten, seven to 10 people there, depending on the time of the year. We have a studio in Whistler, British Columbia. We have a few people there. We claim an address in San Francisco, but it's really because I have an investment in a company there and I keep a couple surfboards there and it's, we do a lot of work in tech, so it makes sense. Uh, and then we have, I'm in Hawaii. I live in Hawaii. And we have had for years a studio and a few employees there as well. So additionally, we have Occupoppers working remotely from places like Madison, Cincinnati, Portland, Brooklyn, Palm Beach, Boulder, and even Austin, Texas. She's right there. Uh, so anyway, I was going to do some sort of longhorn thing just for gratuitous applause, but I decided that would be silly, so I'm not doing it. Um, so leading a group of people from all over the place has its own challenges, right? Like forging relationships that would normally happen around water coolers or walking past people's desks is really hard when you're communicating primarily through fucking GIFs and emojis on Slack, right? Like, it's hard to connect with people. And so, um, think about it this way. Like, I'll use the Grammy test, the same lady that uh, smelled the skunk earlier. Like, if your grandma sent you a really nice card, really pretty, with a nice note in it and a generous check in it, would it ever have the same impact as if she showed up, gave you a big hug, gave you the card, pinched you on the cheek and said, I'm so proud of you? No, fuck no, it wouldn't. And if you disagree with me, you're a fucking dick and you don't deserve Grammy. <laughs> you can all leave. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not all of you, just the people who are jerks. Um, so anyway, to address this challenge of having a distributed team, we started doing these annual retreats to really focus on getting more intensive time together as a team. We made South by a spring retreat, so we've been coming here for seven, eight years. And then we started going on these fall retreats to other places in the, other places in the world. The first year, or actually not the first year, but a few years ago, we went on a retreat to northern Wisconsin, and we started calling the retreats Vision Quests, because that year we focused on dreams. Oh, this is going to be incredibly distracting. You guys aren't even going to listen to what I'm talking about. Um, so we started digging into things. We started digging into like individual employees' dreams and started to overlay them on what the company's dreams were. Were they complementary? Was there conflicts? And interestingly, what we found was there were lots of opportunities for the company to refine its dreams to better align with the personal dreams of our team. One awesome example of this was travel. Everyone across the board voiced dreams that they wanted more adventure, more exploration. They wanted to experience new cultures. They wanted to experience new places. And here's the thing. 
I live in an incredibly remote part of the world. I have to travel all the time for work. So I will often, if there's an opportunity to do a fucking video conference and avoid another 15 hours in an airplane, I will do it in a heartbeat. And so that was my opinion and my perspective. So I started to unintentionally project it onto my team. I would think like, God, I don't want to have to send, I don't want them to have to go to India or to go to Amsterdam. That's a bitch of a flight, like that's going to disrupt their whole week. And so I would just say no. But once I heard all these dreams and desires for more travel, more adventure, adventure, we just started to lobby for more travel, more in-person meetings, more site visits. And the thing was, it was a win-win. All of our team is stoked. They get to go all these cool places. Our clients are stoked because the work is better and more efficient. The relationships we forge with them are deeper and more meaningful. And we're really fucking fun to hang out with. So their job is more fun when we're around. So other things came out of this retreat as well. We were able to find client projects that fed the interests and dreams of our team. So work like the work we do for Sustainable America, refed around sustainability, the work we do for the International Rescue Committee, for uh, Committee, IRC, for FIRST Robotics, for Ushahidi, a lot of the progressive political work that we've been doing lately, because that needs to be done. We all agree on that. <laughs> Other things came up too. We were able to find, oh, I've just read that. So. We were also better able to identify and recruit for positions that helped us create the kind of dream company we were looking for. So I'm going the wrong way here. One moment. I'm so sorry. All right, so we accomplished other important things at the Vision Quest. I make fantastic guacamole, we discovered. We built a web app called Occupop Dream Machine. Basically, it was a web app that, keeps, that we share our dreams on and we keep each other accountable to them. And you know, the theory there was we need to you know, help each other achieve our dreams. The next year at Viva La Vision Quest, which was at an awesome oceanfront resort in Mexico, basically Sarah said I wanted to go on a surf trip and I felt too guilty, so I had to bring everyone and their spouses along. She's basically like 48% right on that. Um, but anyway, so at that, at that retreat we focused on goals. So. Here's the thing, here's the premise. Like every day, and you guys probably have this at your jobs, you have your email, your calendar, your task management, your time tracking, all these things up on your dashboard in front of you every day. But when it comes to goals, personal goals and work goals, every six months at your performance review, the sheet comes out and you talk about your goals. But are they really in front of you ever the rest of the year? At least at our company, they weren't. And so we wanted to get that in there. So now we built, like we had already built the stream machine thing, so we built this web app on top of it called Goalkeeper. And so now say if you had a dream of being a distance runner. You'd, we basically break dreams down to 100-day goals, or goals into 100-day goals or 1,000-day goals. So goals you can achieve in three months or goals you can achieve in three years. So the distance runner example. You might set a 100-day goal for a 5K, a 100-day goal for a 10K, a 100-day goal for a half marathon, and maybe then a 1,000-day goal for um, you know, running a marathon in under four hours or something like that. And then everyone in the company can help you train for those things, can help give you advice, can encourage you, or can make fun of you. Like when our CTO, Tom, left a goal in there for like three years of replacing the bathroom toilet handle. <laughs> so great, right? We built this system for sharing our dreams and like holding each other accountable to them. Then we created a pervasive layer to our workflow that helps facilitate goal setting and goal support that ratchets up to those dreams. Well, what do you need to achieve goals? good habits, right? Like running every day or training for a, run, a marathon or whatever, that's not a goal. Like you need good habits to lead up to it. So then at VQBC, which is Vision Quest British Columbia, we focused on habits. So let me be honest here. This is a really cool and like super empowering for our team and it's been really amazing to see them achieve all these different goals and, and see these dreams closer being realized. But there's additional kind of leadership driven motives here. So this isn't all good coming out of me. Like designers, developers, writers, creative people, me included, have an aversion to, to routine. What is routine? It's just habits strung together, right? And so, but the thing is, is like you only have, a, like the more thinking you have to do ad hoc during the day, the less energy you have for the hard shit you gotta do later in the day. You have a finite reserve of willpower every day that you're drawing from. And the more existential and intellectual energy you have to burn on making decisions that could be habitualized, the less energy you have for the hard shit. Think about like, that's why parents lose their shit on kids, their kids when they're stressed out at work. It's why the stuff harder, like further and further down your to-do list is harder and harder to get done. 
So if I could get our team to establish morning routines that get them from bed to work with zero expenditure of energy, or get them from their like, lunch break back to doing awesome creative work without ex expending any of their ex existential sort of uh, willpower reserve, the more efficient Occupop would be, the happier and more fulfilled our team would be, and the better the work would be. And there might even be additional benefits like that Alcoa story earlier. So here's a quick example. Every consultancy makes money by billing for the time that they work, right? How many people here have to track their time? So, a third of people or something like that. There's a lot of leaders here. We, uh, we're, we're especially shitty at tracking our time, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, so, it's horrible. It's an impossible challenge. No one does a good job of it. Every company struggles with it. And here's the thing. I issued a mandate at this retreat. Everyone is required to meditate. 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes immediately after lunch. It's non-negotiable. We got everyone a Headspace account. It's like it's a recurring task on their dashboard and they have to track time to it, period. It's a habit now. They all do it and they track their time to it. And then they're likely to track their time the next thing they do, and the next thing they do. We've improved our time tracking by like 80% in the last year and a half since we did that. And the other thing is, is like maybe they feel a little bit more fucking taken care of by me and the company and by themselves by meditating 20 minutes a day. So let me go back to that idea of keystone habits. I was trying to think like, what's our keystone habit? Do we have one? It's not time tracking, I hope, because God, that'd be fucking sad. Um, so let me talk about our first paying client. Some of you have heard of Rosa Designs before. It's a high-end floral shop in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She was our first client. Her name was Kitty Costello. Um, she paid us when we, no one really should have been paying us for work because we were brand new and didn't know what we were doing. And we said, all right, Kitty, we'll do this project for you and let you pay us, but we're never going to let you pay us again. It's 20 years ago. She started three other companies since then, had a lot of success. Her most current company is called Daughter Manufacturing. This is a plug. Go there. It's awesome. They make handmade uh, housewares, made in California. But anyway, I remember we were working on the ID, the logo, and she had all these ideas. She wanted it to be red. She wanted it to be in an oval. She wanted to have an illustration of a rose in it. And I remember IMing. Like the Instagram guys were talking about, who used AOL? Like we were using fucking AIM or whatever back in the day with Jeff, the guy I started the company with. And I'm like, how are we gonna like appease all these fucking needs that she's putting out there? Like this is ridiculous. And ultimately, he sent me this interview that, of Steve Jobs uh, about working with Paul Rand on the Next Computers logo. And Paul Rand, or Steve Jobs had said like he was taken aback when he talked to Paul Rand, who's the greatest American logo designer, about like, how the system, how the process would work. Paul Rand was like, you pay me $100,000, I'll give you one option, one logo, and then we're done. And Steve Jobs was like, oh, that seems crazy, like I should get some more options. And ultimately in the interview, Steve, because yeah, I'm a fucking, whatever, first name basis with Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs was like, well, it kind of made sense. Like, he's the expert. I should just trust him and let him do his job. And I remember Jeff Tech IMing me and being like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do that? And I was like, why don't we do that? And so we started doing that. And think about it, like the example I always use is a car mechanic. You don't go to the fucking car mechanic and say, something's wrong with my car, what do we do to fix it? And he says, put a new alternator in. And you're like, fuck that, put air in the tires. Like, not, like, you listen to him, he's an expert, right? <laughs> so we were like, let's do this. Let's position ourselves as experts. Let's defend our positions. Let's justify the decisions we make. That's our keystone habit, saying fuck no. It pervades every layer of our company. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because I'm getting behind, but like giving solutions, not giving options, fighting for our decisions, justifying our thought processes. Like even like our brand new employees, we have a brand new studio manager in the Milwaukee office. She comes to me daily with shit that she knows I'm going to disagree with and fights and fights and fights. She wins 90% of the time. So anyway, jumping ahead. There's a compliment to fuck no. It's called shit yeah. If fuck knows all about positioning ourselves as authorities and having the willpower, the courage to stand up for ourselves, shit yeah is taking advantage of every opportunity and fighting to make the most of every challenge. So you guys, I think, all got fuck no and shit yeah coasters, right? Cool, are you happy with that? Okay, it didn't, see, it didn't seem like you were super stoked. It's like a fucking thousand dollars worth of fucking coasters. <laughs> all right, I appreciate it, he said thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> 
So the rope story, the way Occupop started, those are all stories that play off of this. And as an organization, as we've matured and learned to harness the benefits of this philosophy, it's become a great foundation for who we are and how we've succeeded. But before it was, that's now that it's been institutionalized and improved by everyone in the company. But before that happened, when none of this had been articulated intelligently, and before I really understood what we were or how it could be leveraged, things weren't, weren't quite so rosy. So take a second. Think about this kind of boss. This thing is janky. <laughs> Someone who thrives on being right. Someone who's dead set on always giving only one option. Someone who's ready to counter every argument that everyone ever raises. Diving into things, always impatiently forging ahead with an insane drive and unrealistic expectations. All while riddled with anxiety and harboring an imposter complex. What kind of boss does that sound like? The shittiest boss in the world, right? Like impatient, like, like ready to defend every decision before anyone else even knows what the fuck we're talking about. Like completely impatient, really driving, unrealistic, all these different things. But it's funny. In the first five to 10 years of my career, those things were exactly the things I needed to be a successful one or two person entrepreneur, like a startup, right? Those are table stakes. You're not driven and crazy and unrealistic. You're never going to succeed. But then all of a sudden, 10 years in, eight years in, everything that I built up that awesome facade of that I was so proud of and everyone was impressed by, those are the worst possible characteristics for a leader. I didn't mean to, but I intimidated the fuck out of everyone around me. Everyone was afraid to make decisions and even more afraid to act. I was prolific. And I was inspiring and motivating and actually really fun most of the time. But when I wasn't, I was angry and overwhelmed and awful. And then it all changed. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this because I, I do talks about anxiety and depression. It's all fucking rainbows and unicorns in those talks, let me tell you. Super, super happy talks. But what happened was, is I had a heart attack scare. It turned out not to be a heart attack. It was a panic attack. But I was knocked out of commission for a number of months. I literally couldn't do anything. And I'm not going to talk about the unhealthy ways I tried to cope, the ways I chose not to. But, and to be clear, like, I'm out of it now, but it was not a simple process. And there's a million different things that happened that got me out of that hole. But that process took years, and it's still ongoing. And it worked. And there's still times when things go bonkers, and I feel like I'm falling into the deep. But I feel in control and above water most of the time. So how did I come out of it? How did I change from being a shitty boss to a good one? You can ask them if I am later. Um, a big part of it was therapy. Like, it's a huge lifesaver. Another plug, Ami Betty, best therapist in the fucking world. Check her out. Uh, another huge part of it was being more comfortable in my own skin, being vulnerable, sharing my stresses. Brene Brown spoke at the opening keynote. She's a way better speaker than I am. She knows her shit. She's a doctor. She studies this shit. She says, the only way you can get past feeling like an imposter is to get empathy. But I desperately want you guys to say to me when I talk about these stories, when I say I you know, feel like an imposter, I want you to say me too, right? Well, here's the fucked up thing, right? If I went around my companies I'm a part of saying, I'm fucking terrified. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm full of shit. I'm scared. Would I be a very good leader? So here's the thing, like, I went through this mental health crisis, came out of it, found out, hey, the way you stay healthy is by sharing everything and being vulnerable, but not too vulnerable. Don't share it with everyone. So, you know, how do we do that? It's a delicate balance. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of shoving feelings deep down inside. But, like, you have to find other sounding boards, right? Find other, I often share those imposter feelings with other leaders. I share them with my wife, with my therapist, and in the right ways at the right time with my team. I keep having to come back here. This is the first time I've done this talk, so I appreciate you guys staying with me. Another thing I always do, which I read about in a Harvard Business Review article recently, is being generically vulnerable. Like basically going into a meeting with someone when you're having a horrible day, you know, one of your reports, someone who's, you work, who works for you, and being like, I'm having a terrible day. I am super stressed out and shit is bananas right now, but it has nothing to do with you. I don't want this to affect your day, but if it seems like I'm having a shitty day, it's because I am. You don't have to share any more than that, but just by letting them know that you, know, you are having those feelings, you don't create unnecessary anxiety for them because you know sure as shit, the first thing they're gonna assume is that it's their fault. 
So a huge part of my leadership philosophy from day one has been that I want to protect my team, protect them from worry, protect them from anxiety, protect them from shitty sort of direction from other from clients or other agencies. I always wanted to protect them from finance, worry about finances or job security, and I've always felt this way. But the way I used to protect my team in a lot of ways, by taking all, I would do it by taking all the real responsibility away from them. I would manage everything, I would hide everything, I would carry and drive all the decisions. I would always spread the credit around, but even that, even though it was well-intentioned, was inauthentic. When you give everyone else credit that they know sure as shit they didn't have anything to do with, it's demoralizing, and I would do it all the time. I created an environment not out of ego, but of misdirected anxiety and concern that positioned me as an iconoclast that everyone in the company looked to for every answer. No one had the information or the confidence to get out ahead of me, and as such, I throttled the efficiency of the whole organization. In shouldering the responsibility for coming up with every solution, I drastically held back what we could achieve. As I said a minute ago, when I was knocked out of commission for those few months, I, locked, I learned not only to delegate more, but I shared more stress, more responsibility, and gave more agency and ownership to my team. I started to actually trust them. And I realized that in doing so, my life became better, and I and our agency were transformed. Before that breakdown, I had always created an intense environment that put the pressure on me to perform and on everyone else not to fuck up the path I was blazing. This truly limited the collective brain power we could bring to problems we were facing, and that ultimately limited the scope of what was possible for our team. Now the environment is no less intense, but everyone shares the pressure and the responsibility and the excitement of coming up with the ideas, and the owns the accountability of delivering on them. This is scary as shit for me, and probably even scarier for them, but it has resulted in bolder, better, and more rewarding work for our team and our clients. All right, so I'm gonna end, we've got about 10 minutes left now, with two stories, and then maybe we can do a couple questions. So this first story is about bad leadership. That's Hawken, our son. Uh, a number of years ago, when he was little, he was like three, as he was five, we hired a Manny, uh, this dude, he was my lawyer's son, actually, to come live with us in Hawaii for a summer to watch the kids. He liked to surf a lot. He was not good at being a nanny, let me just tell you that. In hindsight, it was a shit show. But I worked from home a lot at that time, and so he would constantly come into my office and bug me about shit that he should be dealing with, not being a great leader. So anyway, one day, I'm on a video conference, and this dude, we'll call him Brian, <laughs> came into the office, and he's like, dude, Hawken peed in my water bottle. <laughs> I'm like, Blake, I'm... <laughs> I didn't use his last name, at least. <laughs> Fuck. I, like, worked on that. Um, Brian <laughs> said, like, I'm like, dude, I don't, Brian, I don't think he peed in your water bottle. I'm on a video conference. Like, I, I'm working. I can't deal with this right now. He's like, he peed in my water bottle. And I'm like, all right, fuck. All right, guys, I got to go for a minute. I'll be right back. So I go out in the yard. The kids are playing in the yard. He's standing by the house. I'm like, you stay there. I'll go over here and talk to Hawkins. So I pull Hawkins aside, and I'm like, all right, dude. Like, he's a little kid at the point. And I, like, pull him up close, and I whisper in his ear. I'm like, Hawkins, did you pee in Blake's water bottle? Brian's water bottle? <laughs> it, it didn't work at all. Um, he turns to me, and he's like, and he's like, there's this smirk on his face. And he goes, I didn't, but he thinks I did. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like I said earlier, you can only be vulnerable, you can only be like open and empathetic and trusting of your team so much, right? Whoa, I just got a huge head rush from sitting down like that. Um, uh, so that was an example of like a not a very good, honestly, a very gullible leader. But now I want to tell a story, and this one's kind of, Kind of hard to tell, because um, it's pretty personal, and I've actually never told it before. I've told it to like a couple friends, um, but it's, it maybe get me in trouble. I might get hauled out of here. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, a few weeks ago, uh, probably a month ago, I got a, Hawken came home from school, and he was like all excited. He, he's super good at coding. Uh, he loves computers, which is great. Hopefully I can retire soon um, and he can support us. Um, but he was excited because he was like, oh, we got done with our coding work early and Lloyd, we're gonna call him Lloyd, his best friend. God, I'm gonna fuck this up too. Um, me and Lloyd got done with our coding earlier and so we looked through, we started to search on the internet and we searched for you, daddy. And I'm like, oh shit. 
Like, it's just going to be, fuck, 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 shit, 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 fuck, fuck, fuck. Like, what? Like, he's going to get kicked out of school. Well, thankfully, they had safe search on on the computers. So he's just like, yeah, there were a ton of pictures of you at all these different places. It was really neat. I saw a bunch of the work you do. And he really loves designing logos and stuff. So that was cool. And he's like, and then we searched for mommy. And he's like, and it was just a bunch of weird selfies. I'm like, well, makes sense. That's social media, yeah. OK. And then he's like, and then he's like, and we searched for Izzy. And we didn't find anything. And then we searched for Ichi. That's our dog. He's like, we didn't find anything. And then we searched for J Lloyd's dad, and we didn't find anything. And they're kind of weirdos, so I'm glad there wasn't anything on the internet. Um, so anyway, I, was, I didn't even think anything of it. I was just like, oh, cool, that's neat. Like, I'm glad you were proud of me and mommy for being fun and being out on the internet. Like, whatever. Well, then jump forward to like literally last week. I get a call from his teacher. And his teacher is like, Michael, I'm really, don't know how to tell you this, but we looked at Hawkins' computer at school, and he's been searching for some inappropriate stuff. I was like, oh, well, that sucks. What, what kind of stuff? She's like, well, she's, he started searching for you, and then he started for searching for Sarah, and then he started searching for Izzy and the dog, and Lloyd's parents. And I was like, well, sh OK. Like, in my head, I'm like, OK, well, that's fine. Like, he told me about that. That's inappropriate. He shouldn't be spending time at school doing that, but that doesn't sound that bad. And then she's like, yeah, well, no, there's more. I'm like, what? And she's like, well, let me read you the search list. And so we start here. First search was naked. Naked people. Naked lady. Naked dog. Naked face. <laughs> naked ear. Naked pants. Naked poop. Naked turd. Naked teacher. Naked potato. <laughs> Don't search for naked potato. One, the images are really disturbing. And two, like the first result is an urban dictionary thing that you don't want to fucking know what it is. It's not good. <sighs> so I'm like, fuck. And she's like, we have to change the whole policy at the school. He goes to this nice school. He's not allowed to use a computer for months, uh, unsupervised. And I'm just like, shit. And I'm leaving that night on a trip, not this trip, but a previous one. And uh, sorry, guys, has that been horrible the whole time? Um, Sarah and I decide we got to talk to him tonight before you leave on your trip. I'm like, mm, this is going to be hard. He's super he's super defensive. He's the smartest, sweetest, like funniest fucking kid in the entire world. But he will never admit that he did something wrong. And we know that he did something wrong. We have the fucking data. Like we, we this is like a sting. Like, and so we treated it kind of as such. We like brought him into the bedroom and we had Izzy go do her homework in the other room and we set him down and we like, didn't have like a light on him, but we were like pretty well like, we know what you did. <laughs> Tell us what you did. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And we're like, what? You search for inappropriate things at school. And he's like, I don't know what, what kind of inappropriate things. And we're like, fucking like we know, we have the search history. And it went on and on and on. And he got angry. He started gaslighting the fuck out of us, like making, like making me question, like, well, maybe someone else did hack into his account <laughs> and search for fucking naked potato. <laughs> that, maybe that makes sense. And like, it's mind bending, because like, like, parents know this. Like, it's the most important job that I have, and I'm fucking it up. I don't know how to handle this. And like, he's just poking us, needling us, and we're just like losing our minds. And finally. He'd said something, I don't remember what it was, but basically it was like, fuck you, daddy. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're full of it. Like, I'm never going to admit anything. And I lost it. Like, I grabbed him by the, I've never done this before. I grabbed him by the shoulders and I got in his face and I was like, you're fucking making such horrible decisions. It's the first time I've ever sworn at him. Like, you can think that's impossible with how much I swear in this room. But this is all a fucking act. Like, at home, I'm totally white bread, most boring person in the world. But, like, I felt horrible. Like, I literally broke down, like, snot rolling out of my nose, crying instantly. I was like, Sarah, like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Like, he went in his bedroom. I have to leave in 20 minutes. Like, it felt horrible. And I was like, what have I fucking done? Like, I'm a horrible dad. I'm a horrible person. Like, we totally screwed that up. And she's like, he's so frustrating when he gets like that. It's OK. You didn't, like, it's not, you yelled at him. Like, that's fine. And I was just like, I have to talk to him. And so I went in his room. And like, he's sitting on his bed. And he's 
You don't want to leave these up here. Who wants one? Yeah. These have koozies on them. You've been listening the whole time, so I really appreciate it. Who wants one over here? Oh, Jesus. Are you good at catching shit? <laughs> <laughs> Well done. That whole front row was like gonna die there. <laughs> so anyway, I go in his room. That was not a good, like the super dramatic part of this. Oh, beer. <laughs> and I sit down next to him, and he's tears trickling down his face. My, I'm still like sobbing. And I grab his hands, and I'm like, dude, talking like, I am your best friend. I will be your biggest advocate always, even if you do the worst things in the world. I will always try to make it better for you. That's what I want to do. It's okay you looked at that stuff. Like, it's understandable. You're not old enough to be looking at the shit you were looking at. Naked potato, I'm not even old enough to be looking at. <laughs> but like, I'm crying and I was like, it's okay, I did the same sort of stuff when I was a kid. I love you and I want you to be, make good decisions and I'm always gonna fight for you. I'm your best friend. And he just like looked over at me and he was like, yeah, daddy, I did it. Yeah, I looked at all that stuff. I, I'm sorry. And it was like by being empathetic, by being clear, by being direct with him, and by being vulnerable at the right time, I opened, he opened up to me instantly. Instead of being the tyrant that demanded the answers out of him, that drove everyone crazy, I was the vulnerable person that he could connect with. And as a leader, that's what I'm trying to be as I grow up and as I try to be a better boss, a better dad, a better husband, a better person. So thank you guys so much for coming. We've got no room for questions. If you want to ask questions or talk, please come up and talk to me afterwards. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it.